I'm Stephanie Hoffman. I'm here with Catherine Cole. Um, it is August 16th, 2017, and we're at um, your house. And we're gonna start off really easy with our first question, which is why wine? Um, I love wine because it exercises all parts of your brain, and it's something that y you never bore of if you're kind of a nerd and like to read a lot and think a lot. Um, Wine uh, involves an understanding of history, of geography, of geology, of uh, biology, of horticulture. Um, there are just so many ways to come to go about it, to think about it. And I also love that winemakers themselves tend to be sort of um, tortured poet types. So even there's even some sort of kind of literature music to wine. Um, so I just it seems like it's kind of a small subset of food and beverage and yet you can never stop learning about wine and it's just endlessly fascinating to me. Yeah. Um, so how did you get to start writing about wine? Um, I was a magazine editor in Chicago and uh, for lifestyle magazines and I just realized that the sections of the magazine I liked to edit most were the food and beverage sections. Um, I loved editing recipes and I loved editing wine and spirits writing. Um, so when I moved to Oregon and started freelancing, I realized that it would be best to specialize in something and I realized that beverage was something I was very interested in. Um, I got two magazine columns about beverage in general, liquor, beer, wine, and I just kept gravitating toward wine and I looked around and realized that Oregon was probably the most exciting place in the world for wine writing at that time. So I just decided to specialize even further and somehow I convinced the Oregonian to let me be their wine columnist. I'm not sure why they let me do that, but um, I'm very grateful to them for that. Yeah. Um, can you talk about being a wine columnist at the Oregonian? Um, it was a contract position. So um, on the one hand, I had a great amount of freedom in terms of choosing my topics. On the other hand, the pay was awful <laughs> and I could have been on food stamps. Um, so that made it frustrating when people would get angry with me about what I wrote. I'd think, you know, <laughs> I can like barely survive on what I'm being paid um, to do this. But um, it was, it was kind of, it was, it was a great time. I mean, this was starting in 2002. Um, and the industry had progressed to the place where people weren't just in survival mode anymore. They were really kind of pushing the boundaries and trying to figure out what Oregon could be great at. And I felt like I was in the middle of history being made and it was happening all around me. And every time I kind of stumbled across a subject, I realized that, you know, new things were being discovered about this subject right here in Oregon. Um, so it was just immensely intellectually satisfying and I met a lot of really very wonderful people and I'm very grateful for that. Can you talk about um, one of your favorite or most memorable stories you wrote about during that time? Oh, I mean definitely when I wrote uh, an article about biodynamics, I think it was in 2003 and I had never heard of biodynamics before. I thought that, you know, it just kind of stuck with me that this is really interesting and for some reason this, the Oregon winemakers have really kind of hooked into this. Um, and so that stuck with me enough that I thought later maybe I should write a book about this. Um, and, and just biodynamics to me sort of exemplified the way in which Oregon winemakers were willing to just go over the top. You know, they, they, they no matter how crazy something seemed, if, if there was a chance it would make their wine better or make their vineyard healthier, then they would try it. Um, so I, I felt like that movement sort of, it, sort of exemplified the whole ethos of Oregon winemaking. Yeah. Um, so what are some of the challenges of writing about wine? Um, well, one funny challenge of writing about wine, which I only just figured out, is that all day you're Googling topics that have to do with wine and wine prices. And so when you go to buy plane tickets or anything else, you are quoted the highest possible price. <laughs> Meanwhile, you are barely making enough to feed yourself <laughs> doing what you're doing. So there, wine writing is really strange. It's like travel writing and food writing in the way that those who are practicing wine writing are 
doing it solely because it's a passion, like many winemakers. And yet the wine industry is a luxury industry. And there's this weird disconnect where you always feel out of place. Um, and if you haven't made wine, which I, I will admit I'm a total poser, I've never made wine, um, you also feel like, you know, what am I doing? I, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Um, so you, you always kind of feel a little uncomfortable in your skin. Um, I'm sure that's probably the case for those people who cover health, who aren't doctors, although there are people who are doctors who write about medicine. It's probably true for business writers who haven't been to business school. Um, but I think wine in particular, um, technically it's so difficult and people have such strong opinions on what, the, what in their mind is the right way to go about either growing grapes or making wine. Um, you always kind of feel like an outsider just scrambling to keep up as you're covering the subject. Um, and then what is your favorite part then about writing about wine? Um. <laughs> or one of yours? <laughs> uh, that feeling of discovery, um, the feeling that something new is, you know, winemakers are trying something new or, or um, viticulturists are trying something new and they're really seeing results. And th that feeling in Oregon in particular that you're kind of on the frontier and yet this may be the greatest terroir in the world for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Um, so just this constant feeling of awe, like, wow, I can't believe, you know, no one's talked about this before or no one's tried this before and these winemakers are trying it and the results are amazing. So there's just this feeling that there's constantly something new and exciting happening. And sometimes that new and exciting thing is repeating what was done hundreds of years ago, <laughs> but um, with a little more science behind it. <laughs> Um, and then can you talk a little bit about the different um, books you wrote and what was the impetus to each of those? Um, yeah, so I wrote Voodoo Vintners. I think it came out in 2013, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, that was for Oregon State University Press. So that was really kind of a labor of love um, just for the state of Oregon. Um, and it was a, just really discovering this style of, uh, of farming and winemaking called biodynamics. And there really hadn't been a book written to that point about biodynamics that explained this practice in a clear way. There were a lot of really confusing books that no one could understand. And um, when I was reporting on the subject, I couldn't make heads or tails out of these books. And I thought, wow, there are so many war Oregon winemakers who have really compelling personal stories and their personal narratives really interweave into how they discovered biodynamics and they have this personal connection with this very sort of spiritual uh, farming practice. And so when OSU came to me and said, we want you to write a one book, I said, well, I think, I think it has to be about biodynamics because this is just so unusual um, it's, and the, or, the way the Oregon winemakers are practicing it is so unique and personal. Um, that it, and also there are no books like this out there. Um, so that was the first book. And then my next two books aren't really that exciting. <laughs> they were just um, books I wrote on contract just to because someone asked me to write them basically. Um, the second book, um, Complete Wine Selector, How to Choose the Right Wine Every Time, it was a different way of going about choosing wines. I think so many people are over overwhelmed by wine, um, they think that they have to know everything about wine, and this is where the industry has really let the public down. Um, I will never forget being at a dinner once, I'm, I was sitting next to a British wine importer, and he said, in order to appreciate wine, you must read about it, study it, and travel to Europe. And I was like, no, that's, yeah, yeah, you are pushing away customers and that's just so exclusive and rude of you to say that. Um, th we as journalists, we are communicators and we need to br be bringing more and more people into the fold. And I think the same is true for everyone in the trade. Um, so Complete Wine Selector, the idea was if you like this, try this, you know, kind of different ways of getting into wine. Um, and I, uh, the next book actually kind of relates to this thought, which is um, throughout my career, I've co constantly thought about the, th 
the fact that men have been running the wine industry for 8,000 years and women started to run parts of the wine industry, very small parts of the wine industry, like 30 or 40 years ago. So the language of the wine trade is entirely, from my point of view, it's entirely, um, I, I don't want to say it's gender driven, but um, the way men relate to wine is different than the way women relate to wine. Um, and there is a wonderful scholar at Sonoma State University, um, Liz, now see I'm gonna forget her name, Liz Thatch, Dr. Liz Thatch at Sonoma State University did a very interesting study where she um, studied the way men and women relate to wine. And she found that women relate to wine emotionally and socially. Men relate to wine um, in terms of data. They like to have numbers, scores. They like to be able to rattle off names of villages and vineyards, that kind of thing. Um, so my two middle books were kind of looking at wine from a different perspective because I don't think enough has, has been done in, the, in that way. Um, so Complete Wine Selector was a way of, a, a kind of a different way of finding a wine you might like. And then my third book was How to Fake Your Way Through a Wine List. And it was just, you know, kind of insider tips um, for people, but it was particularly aimed toward women um, who, you know, all the people who come to me and say, I don't know anything about wine, I'm so embarrassed. And I, it's like, you shouldn't be embarrassed. This isn't a test. This is supposed to be something fun and pleasurable. Um, but there are some kind of tips I use when I'm ordering wine. I may not know anything on the list, but I still know how to order. So um, that book was just a kind of ways to navigate um, ordering wine. And then it was sort of a compendium of wines from around the world. And my most recent book, Rosé All Day, um, was just sort of a reaction to this massive, I would say, social movement, which is the Rosé movement. Um, you know, a few years ago when the movie Sideways came out, people talked about the Sideways effect and Pinot Noir was exploding. And Pinot Noir sales grew by, I believe, 15% that year. When I was, the year I was writing the Rosé book, 2015, Rosé sales were growing by 60%, six zero. I mean, this was huge and no one was writing about it. So that book, um, I, I felt like, you know, there were no books on Rosé, I had to address this. And again, getting back to the gender issue, um, there, there are a lot of um, interesting ways in which the way that society has changed is reflected in an increased interest in rosé, I believe. So it was just a really fun and interesting book to research and write. Um, so what do you hope people get whenever they read your books? Like what do you want to come out from them? Because they all kind of have, sim not similar themes, but they, what do, what do you want them to get from it? Well, I do have a tendency to get a little geeky and I try not to go too far in that direction. I try to um, inject a little bit of wit in my writing and make it sparkly and fun because uh, reading about wine shouldn't be a burden. And I try to be inviting and welcoming in my writing style. I don't know that I succeed, but I do try. <laughs> Definitely. And then um, to you, whenever you first started writing about wine, when you first came to Oregon, you were freelancing, how has the Oregon wine industry changed um, to now? Oh, it has changed tremendously. Um, when I started, I, I often say when I started writing about wine, I got to know the winemakers in Portland because they were all driving their own vans into mm -hmm. town. And I would see them around town and they'd be making deliveries case by case out of the back of their station wagon or van. And now the industry has grown so, so, so much that everyone's working with a wholesaler. Um, you, you don't see, except for the little um, urban winemakers, you really don't see winemakers driving their wine around town anymore. Um, and it's kind of, it's bittersweet because when I started covering the industry in 2002, it was so much a, a, a labor of love, a passion for these people that they, they kind of didn't care whether they succeeded or not. It was just all about being part of the process and just getting their hands dirty and getting out into the vineyard. And today it's become a little more commercial. A lot more money has come into Oregon. 
Um, and so that's, I'm so happy for the winemakers who are finally thriving after so many years of working so hard. Um, but I do feel like a little bit of the, that wonderful feeling of, of just total, total immersion. I feel like that's, we, there, we've kind of stepped away from that a little bit. Well, following up a little bit on um, you saying that Rosé is a social movement that's happening right now, can you explain a little bit what you mean by that? Uh, well, this is kind of stepping away from Oregon a little mm -hmm. bit. Is that okay? That's okay. No, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, well, so my theory with Rosé is, um, well, first of all, the, you can't explain the Rosé sales numbers by the usual ways in which wine is sold. Um, you can't talk about ads and critic scores. Critics weren't even writing about rosé as, as it was blowing up in popularity. You can't talk about wine going on sale. It, it, it's totally unrelated to the market as we know it. It has been completely a social movement driven by things like Instagram and Facebook, people taking pictures of a beautiful table set for a dinner for friends with rosé on it. And it's really been driven by the beauty of rosé itself um, and also the way people are connecting with it socially. I also think that uh, society has changed quite a bit over the past 15 years or so. And even though we think that we have a more bifurcated society in many ways, there are some ways in which it's, I think American society is far more open and accepting. Um, in 2004, uh, let me see if I can get this right. <laughs> in 2004, many states legalized gay marriage. And that same year, a uh, historian named Joe, oh dear, I'm gonna forget her name. <laughs> I told you my, my brain is, I think it's Joe Paoletti. Maybe I should look that up. Anyway. Uh, in 2004, gay marriage was legalized in many states, and in that same year, there was a marked rise in the number of pink shirts for men and pink ties for men that were sold in the United States. And I think that we've moved away from the 1990s kind of macho movement, and we've moved toward a more kind of equitable society where men don't feel threatened in their masculinity if they're seen drinking a glass of rosé. And I think this, this connects very closely with wine because the macho movement of the late 80s up through the late 90s also coincided with the rise and um, preeminence of Robert Parker as a wine critic. And he believed that the best wines, at, at that time he believed that the best wines were inky, full throttle, um, concentrated, dense, muscular wines. And he literally used words like that to describe his 100 point wines, um, words like full throttle and muscular. Um, so, you know, people were wearing power suits and they were, or, you know, buying 100 point wines that were super dense and super dark and red and really thick and muscular and really difficult to drink. And now everyone's kind of like, you know, I don't need to put on a show. I don't need to wear shoulder pads. It's it's cool, you know? People aren't so kind of terrified by the fact that people can be anywhere on the gender and sexuality spectrum, and it's okay, you know? We're all people. And so I think rosé, you know, there's this whole thing called brosé where guys, you know, they're like thumping their chests and drinking rosé and they're cool with it. And I, I think rosé is a reflection of that. Like, you know, it's just, it's fine. No one's masculinity is being compromised by drinking a pink wine. Um, I also honestly, I mean, this might be pushing it, but I honestly think that as our society becomes more um, culturally blended, you know, I, 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 the idea that wine should either be bright red or clear white is a very recent idea. Um, we didn't used to have the technology to make these nearly clear white wines. They used to be kind of muddy or orange or gold. And the dark red wines that we saw, especially in the 1990s, uh, it, it often took a lot of technology to make those wines so dense and so dark. And I love that we no longer have this bifurcated wine world in which wine is either white or this you know, inky black. Um, 
I love that the spectrum of colors in between are all kind of more accepted now, and that I hope that that's a reflection of society as well. Um, and I love that rosé is kind of all things to all people. If you go to a party and you bring rosé, that's what disappears first, because the red wine drinkers are like, ah, I'll drink some rosé. The white wine drinkers, sure, I'll try some rosé. And it kind of makes everyone happy. So it gives me hope. Rosé gives me hope. <laughs> Um, what would you say is your wine writing philosophy, if you have one? Um, I try to see the world, um, let me think about this. My wine writing philosophy is to try to look around at the rest of the world, even if I'm focusing on something that's very geeky and very kind of part of the insular wine world. I try to think, how does this apply to everyone out there? Whether, you know, it's interest of, of interest to them historically or in terms of their own life somehow. I just, I think that wine has a tendency to become too insular and people get too passionate about things that really don't matter to the rest of the world and we just have to keep taking a breath and stepping outside of it and remembering that this isn't everything. Um, but there are so many ways in which wine can make the world a better place, so we also kind of need to keep that in mind. Um, I was thinking about, when I was preparing for this interview, I was thinking about, um, I think it was 1973, the moment in Oregon wine history that no one really talks about that was probably the most important thing that ever happened and it was the formation of the, now I'm going to forget what it's called, uh, Oregon ODLDC, something like that, the Oregon Department of Land. Hmm. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> anyway, so in 1973, David Adelsheim and I believe David Lett um, worked really hard to make sure that not vineyard land, but potential vineyard land would be saved from development for commercial purposes. And no one really thinks about that or talks about that today. People talk about David Adelsheim bringing the clones over from Burgundy and all these other things. But really, that was so, so important because, you know, this farmland or possible farmland was being saved for a future that people at that time couldn't even envision, a future when people would be traveling from all over the world to visit Oregon wine country. And you know, people would be coming from Burgundy and California to buy our land because it's so precious. And the terroir, some people say, some Burgundians say, is the best terroir in the world for Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. No one at that time knew that this would be happening. They didn't know that they would be contributing so much to the economy of the state of Oregon. Um, so I, I try to I try to keep moments like that in mind, where you know, just in the act of making wine or making it possible to make wine, you really can make the entire world a better place. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> but now I want to look at is it O D L D C? Oh anyway. <laughs> um, so um, you talked about this a little bit, but um, in a lot of your writing you try to make wine accessible for um, everyone who wants to drink it. Why do you think that's so important? Because I think that wine becomes, it, it defeats itself when people get too caught up in it being something that no one else should have access to. And um, I think that the point of wine is to make people happy, it's to bring people together around a table, it's to get people talking and, and enjoying each other's company. It's a very social, it's a very social beverage. Um, I suppose beer is the same way, but w with wine, there's so many things you, you can you can look at it and remark on how beautiful it is. You can talk about the story of the family that maybe grew the grapes or made the wine, um, and it it really is overall, I think, a social beverage more than anything else. Um, so I, I try to just keep that in mind and keep in mind that the more people we can bring under the umbrella of wine, of, you know, wine appreciation, again, the happier the world will be. And it's okay if they're going to start with a wine that's only $8 a bottle. Um, they need to start somewhere. And we need to be kind and 
welcoming to those people who have, you know, quote unquote, stupid questions when they come to a tasting. Those, those are the people we should be the kindest to and the most welcoming to, rather than the people who think they know everything and maybe would spend a little more money, but, you know, maybe they're not going to enjoy the wine as much as someone who's just beginning to learn about it. Yeah. Um, so you write books and you've written for magazines, but you also have a podcast. Yes. Why do you um, have so di many different mediums for getting out your message about wine? And why do you think that's important? Well, my um, podcast is actually food and beverage. Mm -hmm. And um, I had been wanting to, I've, I've been pitching this podcast for 10 years before it got rolling. Um, I love being in a different form of media. Writing is very solitary and it's very difficult, you know, on a rainy day to just be staring at your computer screen and <laughs> having no one to talk to. So um, I, loved, I love the idea of the podcast because it's called The Four Top and the concept is it's like sitting around a table for four in a restaurant and that feeling of conversation that gets flowing and ideas that get flowing and, and that can only happen when you have three or four people sitting around bouncing ideas off each other. I can sit around writing by myself, you know, for days and never come up with the the, the way, you know, the point of view that I can get just by speaking with other people. Um, so, th th and then the other thing is um, the four top is food and beverage and even though we don't overtly say it, we keep in mind with all the topics we choose that food and beverage are inextricably intertwined with human rights, sustainability, and culture. And we try to, even though we don't overtly say anything about it, we try to sort of tie every topic back to one of those, um, one of those kind of the th three legs that we've built the idea of the podcast on. The other thing we try to do is have a lot of fun and we laugh and we tease each other and goof off. And I have found that with podcasts, people tend to listen through their earbuds and they tend to relate to it differently than they relate to radio. It's um, listening by appointment rather than listening by accident. You know, you turn on your car radio and you just listen to whatever's there. But with podcasts, people make a point of downloading it. They make a point of listening all the way through the show they listen through earbuds while they're jogging or something, and so they're not gonna change the station or flip ahead. Um, so they begin to feel like the people who are hosting the podcast really are their friends. And so there's a more relaxed um, feeling in, in a podcast where you can be a little looser and laugh a little more. And I think that helps to bring people in. And I've been very pleased to hear that you know people from Australia, all over the world, have um, contacted us to say, you know, I didn't know anything about food and wine before I started listening, and now I've discovered it because just even if I don't understand every term you guys throw out, um, the tone is very welcoming. So um, yeah, so I wanted to do a podcast to just kind of reach out to a different audience, and I also think that. People under the age of 40 are probably not listening to the radio anymore, definitely not reading the newspaper anymore. So how can we reach out to those people with the message that food and wine um, really can change the world? Well, we can do that through podcasting, I think, I hope. <laughs> we need more listeners though, so. <laughs> um, well, you've t touched on this just um, recently, or just right now, but um, you talk a lot about taking political action with your food and beverage choices. Like, what do you mean by that? Um, it's difficult because you start talking about something like GMOs and every side is right and every side is wrong. Um, but I think that as much as possible, we need to support sustainability in our food choices. Um, we need to support ways to get um, healthy, sustainable foods to people who can't afford them. We need to do something about the fact that healthy food is only accessible um, and available to people who are in the upper middle class to upper class. That seems wrong. Um, so I, I think that I think that we can make change. Um, and I think that the, the food and beverage community has more power than it realizes it does. Um, I certainly think, especially with, with wine, um, 
where am I going with this? With wine, I've always said that um, wine is a gateway drug to sustainability. Um, so people start to learn about wine, they start to appreciate it, and they start to think, oh, I, I really only want I really only want to drink wines that are coming from organic, organically farmed vineyards. I really only want um, wines that are coming from small family wineries. And just because they're following their taste buds, they start to zero in on quality and with quality comes sustainability. And they begin to realize that it's worth paying a little more for a product that was um, you know, came from fruit grown on a small, sustainable family farm. And by supporting a small, sustainable family farm, they're promoting the whole idea of saving that land, like I talked about before, um, making sure it isn't developed. And I think once you have that mindset, you bring it to food as well. And I think it goes both ways, but it's interesting how wine kind of often is ahead of the curve um, in these kinds of movements. What is the current wine culture in Oregon and in the United States? Um, the current wine culture is interesting because the you're seeing larger wine corporations move toward quality because the consumer is now becoming more discerning. Even the consumer that we once thought was only going to buy $12 bottle of wine. Now those those folks, even if they don't have more money in their households, they're now willing to spend more for higher quality wine. Um, and you're seeing that with companies like Trincaro Family Estates in California, just since 2000, I wanna say 13, has been investing a lot of money in small labels. And these are the guys who put out Sutter Home, you know, they've been investing a lot of money in um, small family wineries like Nyer's Vineyard in the Napa Valley. So this is definitely something that, that's being driven by consumers and the market's reacting. And we're seeing that in Oregon, obviously, with Jackson Family Wines buying up multiple uh, vineyard properties here and multiple Oregon family wineries. Um, we're seeing that with, uh, what is it, uh, Precept and Bacchus, um, two other uh, corporations that are, or firms that are purchasing up, purchasing Oregon wineries. And I think what they're seeing is that the American taste is getting a little more discerning and um, the consumers are willing to spend a little more. So, did I answer that? Yeah. Um, so, trying to look a little bit more towards the future, what do you think is in the future for the Oregon wine industry? Well, it's interesting because when I started covering Oregon wine, um, a lot of winemakers kind of happily told me that, you know, we're the anti-Napa and we're nothing like California and we don't have big money coming in here and, and sort of determining the way our industry is going to go. And of course now that's happened and we have a lot of money coming in from California and wine has become more commercial here. Um, however, I don't think that we will become an entirely commercialized industry. Uh, the average winery in Oregon is still 5,000 cases or less. Um, and I think that the influx of talent and interest from Burgundy is going to keep Oregon focused on quality. And I believe Oregon is still one of the top two wine regions in the world in terms of having the highest per bottle price. And I don't think anyone's going to let that slide. I mean, it would be stupid for that to happen. So I do hope and, and believe that Oregon will continue to grow as a wine industry, but in disparate, disparate uh, estates, disparate wineries, rather than you know massive single wineries just churning out millions of gallons of sort of mediocre wine. I hope that's, I hope that's the future. I also think that we're gonna be seeing more vineyards in the coast range, more vineyards at higher elevations, and uh, different varieties being grown as the temperatures warm up. We've certainly had a, a very hot summer, uh, this summer in 2017. So it'll be interesting to see if that, if that uh, trend continues. Yeah. And then what do you think is in the future for the wine culture, um, and particularly the United States? I really think that the United States 
even though in some cases we're kicking and screaming about it, is moving toward a more kind of European model. We have more urban wineries, we have uh, urban breweries and urban coffee houses where people are going just to enjoy each other's company and enjoy a beverage that is much higher quality than something they could get at Starbucks or at the grocery store. Um, and I think that this is driven in part by the fact that real estate prices are so high. People are moving into the city, they're moving in, sharing an apartment, they're squashed in there, but they wanna be where exciting things are happening, so they're spending more and more time outside of their the place where they live. Um, so I think this can be a good thing, even though <laughs> many people don't want us to become Europe. I think, I think in some ways, it's a good thing that real estate is becoming more expensive because I think it's driving a more urban society. And then um, what projects are you looking forward to in the future? Well, <laughs> uh, I'm sort of in a, um, at a career crossroads right now. My publisher wants two more books, but I don't know if I can afford to write two more books. So um, actually one thing I've been delving in recently has been working with design firms, uh, working on winery websites and apps and that kind of thing. And that's been really fun. I think that Oregon is still really catching up in terms of design and um, being able to accurately offer their products on the web and really connect directly with the consumer. I'm shocked by how many Oregon wineries either have really just unattractive labels and logos, and I'm shocked by how many Oregon wineries have websites that are you know, not, not functional and do not have the information that I'm looking for and it's very difficult to purchase the product from those websites. That's a place where Oregon really needs to catch up and we need to do it now. So I have been doing a little freelancing with design firms and it's been fun um, and I think that, that we can do a lot more with that. And then if you were able to do any story um, in the world, what would you want to focus on? What would, what would that story be? Hmm. Any story in the world? You mean just to write an article? Yeah, or yeah. an article or a book about, or you can do just specifically Oregon, even. Oh, <laughs> I was going to say. Or you do well. <laughs> uh, huh. I mean, I should say Oregon. I'm, you know, part of me wants to say, well, the Canary Islands. Um, <laughs> which has really fantastic wines, but um, in Oregon, I don't know. I, I did just write an article on something called Black Chardonnay that was pretty fun to write. And it was exciting to realize that people in Oregon are maybe driving a movement and a term that no one had really heard before might be coming out of Oregon. So. Any story where it seems like um, Oregon winemakers are pushing the envelope is a story that excites me. Yeah. And then what advice do you have for someone wanting to write about wine? Uh, get a really high paying job and write about wine at night. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. Don't have a family. <laughs> it's hard. I mean, you can't. I, I'm part of, I mean, I, I'm struggling with the thought that I really do, I, I have pulled away quite a bit and I probably need to pull away more because you can't be traveling all the time and not making money and continue to do, to do this profession, even, no matter how much fun it is and how interesting it is. So I don't know what advice I have. Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's pleasurable, but it, it's, it's not a realistic profession, except for maybe three or four people in the United States. The rest of us are living an unrealistic life by trying to write about wine. I'm sorry to say that. <laughs> I hope that changes. I hope that changes. But part of that has to do with um, the kind of the end of print journalism. So timing. <laughs>